Every patient has a family health history that can indicate an increased or decreased risk of developing certain health conditions. A general family history should be collected during annual wellness visits and should include questions about the ages of family members, major medical diagnoses and chronic health conditions, hospitalizations, major surgeries, reproductive and pregnancy concerns, known inherited or genetic conditions, birth defects, developmental disorders and intellectual disabilities, and age and cause of death of relatives. Some clinicians obtain this type of information through patient forms, and others ask the questions during the visit itself. We'll review the key parts of a family health history that can help guide the care you provide and review the various ways to collect the information. A key piece to getting started is identifying the patient's family members and their biological relationships to them. Parental information, such as whether your patient was adopted or donor conceived, is also valuable. All of these pieces of information play an important role in understanding which conditions the patient is at higher risk of developing. Another piece of the family history to obtain is ethnicity information or genetic ancestry. All of this information contributes to your patient's genetic identity and can help inform the interpretation of their family health history. There are different ways to collect family health history. Forms and verbal inquiries for information are two possibilities, but a general family history may also be obtained using electronic family history tools available for free to patients like the U.S. Surgeon General's My Family Health Portrait or tools from the Electronic Health Record, abbreviated EHR, itself. Family history information can be linked to a patient's EHR and updated during a visit, or if accessible by patients directly, they can be encouraged to keep their information updated. Some specialists, like genetic counselors, prefer to use a graphic visualization of family history called a pedigree. Pedigrees are particularly useful for inheritance pattern recognition when a patient has, or is suspected of having, a particular health condition, or has a condition or group of related conditions that run in the family. For instance, if a patient is suspected of having ovarian cancer, a pedigree would allow the provider to document and describe other family members with ovarian, breast, colorectal, or other types of cancer. Then, more specific follow-up questions can be asked about family members with these potentially significant conditions, like age of onset, additional symptoms or characteristics, and if there was a confirmed diagnosis. Asking if family members have seen specialists or have had genetic testing can be especially informative and can be noted in the pedigree or in an electronic health record family history form or table. Let's explore the symbols used in a pedigree. Pedigree symbols represent the relationships in a family and the individuals with a particular health condition, as well as those who are known carriers of genetic risk for the condition, those without the condition, and those whose status is unknown. In addition to first-degree relatives, parents, siblings, children, a pedigree should also include second-degree relatives, half-siblings, aunts or uncles, nieces, nephews, grandparents, grandchildren, and third-degree relatives, great-grandparents or great-grandchildren, and first cousins. The first family member who brings the concern of potentially genetic health condition to medical attention is called the proband. The patient seeking medical advice is called the consultant. Sometimes the consultant is also the proband. A square on the chart indicates a person who identifies as a male. A circle indicates a person who identifies as a female. For people who are transgender, use the notation AMAB, assigned male at birth, AFAB, assigned female at birth, or UAAB, unassigned at birth, next to their symbol. A diamond can be used for people who identify as non-binary and for other instances of gender diversity. Since both sex assigned at birth and gender identity are clinically relevant when assessing and discussing genetic risks, a safe and affirming environment helps to encourage the disclosure of this information. Individuals with the condition of interest are represented by filled-in shapes, and those without the condition have empty shapes. Various fill patterns can be used to indicate carrier status and other clinical findings and should be defined in the legend. Shapes with the diagonal line through them represent family members who are deceased. One horizontal line connecting two individuals means they are in a relationship, and a line extending downwards from that line connects them to a row of their children. If there are two horizontal lines between two individuals, then this is a consanguineous relationship, meaning they are related, indicating a higher risk of passing on autosomal recessive conditions. 
two dashed lines in the middle of the one relationship horizontal line indicates the two are no longer together, either separated or divorced. Once created, a pedigree can also be used to visualize the condition's inheritance pattern, either monogenic or complex, also called multifactorial. Monogenic inheritance patterns follow simple genetic patterns and are influenced by single variants and single genes and are less influenced by non-genetic factors. There are four types of monogenic inheritance, autosomal recessive, autosomal dominant, X-linked, and mitochondrial inheritance. On a pedigree, autosomal recessive conditions usually appear in multiple individuals in a single sibship or group of siblings, while autosomal dominant conditions are typically present in multiple generations for milder or late onset conditions. However, smaller family sizes in the modern era may make it difficult to discern this in practice. Meanwhile, many conditions follow complex inheritance with multiple genetic environmental factors influencing development of a condition. So in a pedigree, complex patterns may be less evident and often appear to have fewer clear links between individuals who develop the condition. So the best approach to identifying the condition's cause or etiology is to look for monogenic patterns first and then, if all are eliminated, consider complex origins. Now, family history is only one piece of the risk puzzle, and genetic testing, either through direct-to-consumer, abbreviated DTC, genetic testing, or clinical genetic tests, can also help gain further insights into a patient's risk. Regardless of how information is obtained from a genetic test, it's important to discuss the differences between family history and genetic test results with patients. Each one on its own may tell a different story, but together they can provide a more complete picture of a patient's personal risk for developing a health condition. For instance, a patient with a family history of age-related macular degeneration may take a genetic test that says they are at typical risk for macular degeneration. In this situation, depending on the comprehensiveness of the test, the patient may still be at increased risk. So a patient should be informed that although the genetic test indicates they may be at typical risk, because of their family history, they may still be at increased risk and need to receive regular screenings for macular degeneration. Now, as a quick recap, a patient's family health history can be an important indicator of genetic etiology of a condition and can be useful in estimating a patient's risk. There are various methods to collect and represent the family health history, which should be regularly updated. Pedigrees are a classic representation of the biological relationships and medical conditions in a family and can be particularly useful to either identify or rule out a monogenic inheritance pattern.